We were without hope, but God. This morning we have arrived at one of these wonderful, life-changing, earth-shattering places in the Bible. And you might be wondering, that's, that, that, might, that sounds a little bit like extreme language. I mean, that's a lot of big adjectives and adverbs there. Um, this is earth-shattering. This is life-changing because Paul is about to introduce to us a new truth that is in complete contrast to the one that he has spent such a long time articulately, articulately, I'm not even saying that articulately. Does that even sound right? <laughs> the one that he has just spent a lot of time establishing. All right, so just to bring us up to speed where we're at and just to bring this all into full context, go ahead and put Romans 3 verse 10 up on the screen. Everybody read this out loud with me, all right? As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And then go to verse 12 and put that up on the screen. I'll read the beginning part of it. It says, they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. And everybody out loud with me, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. We are are all guilty. All the world is guilty before God. We know that we're guilty. The only thing that we deserve is condemnation. And we've spent all the way since the middle of chapter one, for us here personally, it's been the past four Sunday morning messages explaining how we are all guilty, how there is none righteous, how we all deserve nothing but condemnation. And then all of a sudden you get here to verse 21, put that up on the screen and everybody read those very first two words out loud together. It says, but now. Now let's do that with a little bit of enthusiasm, all right? But now. Brace yourselves. We're going to get into some good news this morning. What we are about to uncover, what we are about to discover, what we are about to learn today is something that is absolutely wonderful and magnificent. And that leads me to the title of my message this morning, which is this, Justification 101. Justification 101. Now, justification is a big word. It is a legal word, but it has a really simple definition. You can remember what the word uh, justification means with just two words, to declare righteous, okay? So when we're talking about justification, we are talking about to be Declared righteous. Everybody say declared righteous out loud with me. Ready? Declared righteous. Okay? I want you all to get that into your heads and just to remember that simple definition because you'll come to this word justified a lot as we go through the book of Romans. I'm going to be explaining it more today. It's a word that is associated with our salvation, and it's something that we need to know and understand. And the simplest way to understand it is to be declared righteous. Now, again, I, 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 before I jump into this message, I, I want to bring us back into where we're at. I wish we could have just worked our way all the way through chapter one, through chapter three in one setting. But just to fully wrap our minds around again where we are, look back at verse 20 of Romans chapter three. It says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So we get done with verse 20, and he says, There shall no flesh be justified by the deeds of the law. Based on our works, based on the law, we are all condemned and we are all guilty. And there is no way that any of us are going to be declared righteous. Now, in our human thinking, I think that we think that there's always a, a loophole and a little bit of a way out of it, okay? Has anybody in here ever been pulled over by a police officer for speeding before? Anybody ever been pulled over? Come on, confess your sins. It's okay. I have been once or twice or maybe 20 times. I don't know. It's been a lot. But anyway, have any of you ever found mercy when you've gotten pulled over by a police officer and they let you out of the ticket? Anybody? Isn't that a wonderful, nice feeling? I was thinking back to this. I, I remember it was several years ago. It was before I became the pastor, but I was on my way to school here one morning, and uh, down by the U-Haul 
Which way am I going? Milton's that way, okay. Down by the U-Haul and where the school administration building is, it used to be Kmart and it used to be Food World. There's a red light right there. And on, on my way to school, that, that light turned from green to yellow and I just kept going right through. I didn't think nothing about it. I mean, it was a yellow light, okay? It was justified. I was just rolling on through. I get through the light at Avalon and I get all the way down here to right in front of our building, right in front of the church and school. And all of a sudden I look in my rear view mirror and there's lights and it's a Milton police officer and he pulls me over and I did a couple of really dumb things that morning. The first thing I did was I got into the turn lane and I rolled my window down and I pointed, I was like, I'm just gonna go over there. I'm getting off the road, I'm going over that way. And I did something that was not intelligent at all. I, I didn't pull like farther down out of the way. I pulled around and into the school and church parking lot where I work. And I have a police officer sitting behind me with his lights on. So I pull up in there and then I did something else really dumb. I opened up my door to get out to say to him, hey, I work here, I'm gonna park up there. Well, I opened the door and I got out and I started talking. He said, get back in your car. You don't get out of your car, okay? I, I learned that that day. That was not smart at all, I know. So then I'm doing that. And then he comes up to me and he's like, do you know what you did? And I said, not really, sir. He's like, well, you ran a, a red light back there. And I was like, well, it was one of those lights that it was like turning yellow and you should either like, I either had to speed up or slow down. And he's like, that's right, but you did neither. And I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> I did just keep on cruising. He's like, you didn't either. And so he goes back to his car and then he comes back for a little bit and he's like, listen, running red lights is a big deal, even if it's yellow. He's like, the very first thing that I responded to as a police officer was a fatality of somebody that ran a red light. And so this was a big deal to him. And he's like, in fact, I just pulled over. Uh, he's like, he, <laughs> the other thing that was funny, I left this part of the story out. It wasn't just any regular day at school. It happened to be parent day. <laughs> And I'm sitting out there and I told him, I was like, sir, do you think you could really let me go park somewhere? And like, could you turn those lights off, please? And he's like, no. And all this time I'm sitting there, there's every car under the sun is coming. And all of our parents are showing up at school for parent day. So he comes back a little while later and he starts explaining why it's such a big deal. And he said, in fact, I pulled a deacon from my church over about a week or two ago. And all of a sudden a light bulb just went off in my mind. I was like, a deacon in your church? I was like, did you give him a ticket? And he said, no, and I won't give you one either. <laughs> and I was like, yes. He's like, this is enough embarrassment for you anyway. All of these people that have driven by, he's like, make sure you don't do that again. And I was so thankful, man. I was so thankful that, that he let me off. I got mercy that day. And the reason why I bring this up is because I think sometimes in our mind, when we think about our sin, we, we think about it in terms of, well, man, Sometimes the, a deacon's a pretty good person. They might get away with it or a pastor might get away with it. Or if I weigh my works out, I mean, this wasn't really that big of a deal. So maybe I'm gonna somehow find mercy in the eyes of the greatest judge in all of the earth. But according to verse 20 and according to everything that Paul has laid out, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. There's no getting out of it. There's no escaping condemnation. We're not, we're, we're not going before a judge that is, is frivolous or that could make up his mind and do what he wants. No, we are all guilty and he is righteous. And because we have violated the deeds of the law, we are gonna get what we deserve. That's the context. And Paul has, like I said, spent so much time explaining this. And then all of a sudden we get to verse 21. And he says, but now, but now there's a contrasting view that is going to come onto this scene here. And he goes on a little bit further and he says, but now the righteousness of God, what are the next three words right there? Without the law, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. There is hope. There is a way we can be declared righteous apart from the works of the law. And that's not just good news. That's the best news that we could ever hear in our lifetime. Hey, truth matters. How many of you believe it's extremely important that we get our facts straight about the best news that has ever been delivered in all of the world? So that's what we're gonna be looking at this morning. Justification 101, let's just jump right into it, okay? So justification is by grace alone. Justification is by grace alone. Let's look at verses 21 and 22 and get the full context here of, of this transition and where we're going. He says in verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets 
even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. The full context of this whole entire passage began back in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, where he said, Paul said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And then he slowly, methodically lays it all out. We are guilty. We deserve condemnation. But that's what what Jesus Christ left heaven and he came into this earth to do. That's what he went to the cross. He died and there is a righteousness that is now available that is apart from the law. So here's what we got to understand. Justification is by grace alone. And by grace alone, God intervenes. The but now, that's God intervening. And this righteousness that is without the law, it's not some new idea. It's not some new concept. It was witnessed by the law and the prophets. It's always been available. We're going to go back to the example of David. I feel like we've talked about David the past two weeks, and we've talked about the same story, but that's because Paul is actually going to use this in his argument. He's going to use the illustration of David in chapter 4 as he builds this out even more, and we'll get into that in the future. But I want you to understand that David was guilty of some horrendous sin. He committed adultery. The lady that he committed adultery with got pregnant. He tried to cover up his sin in getting her pregnant with her husband. Her husband was an honorable and just man and would not go into his wife while, his, uh, while all of his brothers were out at war and on the front lines. And so then David does something even more horrific. He tries to cover up his sin by basically, not basically, by having her husband Uriah killed. Months go by. David thinks that he's gotten away with this. I guarantee you his conscience was just bugging him the whole time. Months come by. Nathan the prophet shows up. And Nathan comes in and tells him this, this dramatic story. He said, hey, you have this farmer in your kingdom. And he's got one lamb. And he loved his lamb. And he took good care of his lamb. That lamb was everything to him. And this really rich farmer came along and stole his lamb and took it from him. And David looks back at Nathan and says, that man deserves to die. And Nathan looks right back at David and says, you are the man. And instantly David knows that he is guilty before God. And in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. What I love about David is there are no buts. There's no, yes, I did that, but you have to understand the reasoning for that. That's not acceptable when we come before God. We are guilty. There are no ifs, ands, and buts about it. We are 100% guilty and worthy of condemnation before God. And David went before God in that type of a way, and he said, I have sinned against the Lord. And in that same verse, in that very same verse, it says, and Nathan said unto David, the Lord hath also put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. David deserved condemnation. He deserved wrath. He deserved the full extent of the law, but instead he found grace. God intervened in the situation. Now, I, I don't want you to miss this. There were still consequences. There were some horrific consequences. Nathan told him, because you have given cause for the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme God's name. Because you are the king of God's people, you've opened up a door for the enemies of God to blaspheme his name. Because of that, your child with Bathsheba is going to die. And that's exactly what happened. Another consequence that came, and David said, and the sword shall never depart out of your house. And from that day forward, if you read through the life of David through 2 Samuel, his family and his home was an absolute, complete train wreck. And there was one issue after another to where one of his sons, Absalom, actually took the kingdom from him for a while and overthrew him. There were some horrific consequences that came as a result of his sin. But David found forgiveness. Go ahead and put chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 up on the screen. This is what Paul's going to use in the next chapter. And he says this, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, unto whom God counts righteousness without works. And then he says this, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. 
When we're talking about a justification of being declared righteous that is apart from the law, it's not something that's brand new. It's something that's already been on the table. And you know what that is? It is somebody whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered by grace alone. God intervenes and he gives every single one of us who are guilty of nothing but condemnation. He gives us the opportunity to be forgiven, to have our sins covered, to have them washed away. This is amazing. It's absolutely amazing because look at what he says in verse 23. He comes back to it. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Don't forget, just because there's a righteousness that's available without the law, don't forget what our main problem is. We have all sinned and we have come short. We have missed the mark. We have fallen short of the glory of God. Our biggest problem is not the sins that we commit against one another. Our biggest problem is the sin that we have committed against God. We have fallen short of his glory because we've rejected his glory. We are rebels. That's the bottom line. You and I, when we look at the glory of God, we were not thankful for God. We, we question God. We doubt his goodness. We doubt his mercy. We question his wisdom. And we pursue in ourselves our own way of what we think is going to bring us the best. And every single time we do that, it always leads to disaster. Why do you think this world has so much dysfunction in it today? Does, by the way, do you think that the world has a lot of dysfunction in it? Our world's a mess. There is so, why is there dysfunction? It's because our world is in rebellion against God. We've missed the mark. We've fallen short of his glory. We are all sinners. And in spite of that, by grace alone, God intervenes. And here is where this word shows up. He intervenes and justifies. He declares this righteous. Look at verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace. If you don't have verse 24 highlighted, underlined, circled some of those words in there, man, that is a highlightable verse in the Bible. Being justified freely by his grace. Let's start with that being justified. Being justified, this verb is passive. Just, justifying is something that a judge does, okay? It's not something that you do. We don't justify ourselves. It's something that is being done to us. Justification is an act of God. The righteous judge on his throne gets his gavel. He hits it. He says, no, they're declared righteous. Boom, boom. It's over and done right there. Takes his gavel and hits it on the desk. Justification does not change our nature. Okay, that's what sanctification does. That's what the work of the Holy Spirit does. It does not change our nature, but you know what justification does? It changes our standing before God. We went from being condemned and guilty to now we're gonna be declared righteous righteous. This is not pardoned. How many of you think that being pardoned is a pretty good deal? I mean, if you get pardoned, if you are guilty of a crime and you get released from the punishment of the crime, that's pretty awesome. That's something that's worthy of rejoicing about when you find mercy. But this is not pardon. This is something that goes beyond pardon. This is something that's, that's greater than pardon. This is a declaration of a righteous status. There was and is no grounds for punishment to begin with. Did you get what I just said? There was and is no grounds for punishment to begin with. Uh, let me try to put it in a way that we can fully wrap our minds around. Do, do any of you like football? Anybody ever watch football? Sometimes in football, the game happens really fast and there's questionable calls. And sometimes if they're not sure of how, if the, if the officials got it right on the field, do you know what they do? They send the call up to a booth review. And they go and they'll slow down and they'll use video evidence. And when they come back with the video evidence, there's two things that they'll do. They'll either say the call on the field stands. Well, when the call on the field stands, that's okay. But that, that just means that there is no undisputable video evidence to overturn the call. There's still some question marks that are left in the mind. But when they come back and they say, the call on the field is confirmed, I guarantee you that official that made that call, he loves to go back and have his call confirmed. He likes it to be declared righteous because he got it right to begin with. And it wasn't even like there's any question marks about it. No, he got the call 100% completely right. That's essentially what's happening here. We're going before the judge and he is not just confirming the call on the field. It's not the call on the field stands, no. The call on the field is confirmed. We are declared righteous. There was and is no grounds for any questioning this fact whatsoever. I don't know about you, that, that's, 
<laughs> we are condemned and guilty. We can be declared righteous. How does this happen? Being justified, everybody look at that verse four, uh, 24. We gotta get this, okay? Being justified, what's that next verse? Word, word, sorry. Being justified, how many of you like that word free? I love the word free. Free is a nice word. Free is a great word, okay? That means you can go do something. It costs you absolutely nothing. Listen, we are justified in a way that you cannot pay for it. When you work for somebody, you don't get grace. You get what? You get wages. You get your payment. You get something that you deserve. When you work for somebody, you know what you do? You put the owner, you put your employer in debt of you, and they now owe you something as a result of it. Guess what? God owes us nothing. In fact, it is an abomination. It is an abomination to think that, that we could earn or pay for or work for our justification. No, that, that's impossible. We are guilty and we can't put God in debt of owing us something for some of the good that we have done because at the end of the day, it's all unrighteousness. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. And it's an abomination to think that we could ever put God in a position where he now has to pay us and declare us righteous for something that we have done. It doesn't work like that. Justification is free. <laughs> being justified freely by his grace. You know what grace is? Grace is unmerited favor. I love, I love the difference between mercy and grace. Mercy is, it's like being pardoned, okay? Mercy is you're guilty. Mercy is what that police officer gave me that one day. I was guilty. I deserved a ticket. He gave me mercy. He let me out of my punishment. But you know what grace is? Grace is unmerited favor, Grace is going the extra mile, and it's not only am I going to pardon you, not only am I going to forgive you, but I'm going to declare you righteous. I'm going to adopt you into my family. I'm going to make you a child of God. Do you understand this morning that justification is by grace alone, and by grace alone, God intervenes and justifies. Anybody want a free gift this morning? I just want to set this up again, just so you understand what we're talking about. I got three Covington Mercantiles. It says, our gift to you. It's good for $5 off your next order. Anybody want a free gift this morning? Okay, I got some kids in here that do. I got some people raising their hands back here. Here, Finn, here you go. Coffee is exactly what you need, buddy. <laughs> right there. All right, how about this? I'll give one to Sarah over here. Here's a free gift. And all right, you boys back there. Okay, here, right here. I'll give you this. Sorry if you sit in the back. You should sit in the front. There's perks that come with sitting in the front of the church. Did any of those people do anything to earn that gift? They raised their hand. There's always somebody in every crowd. No, the point is this, though. With a gift, there is one action when it comes to the gift. The only thing you got to do is take the gift. That's it. It's a gift. It's not yours until you take possession of it, okay? So when we're talking about justification, I only had three of those. So in that sense, it's bad. But justification is available to all men without discrimination. It's available to every single person here. All you got to do is reach out and take the gift. Thank you for adding that in there, Daniel. That helped out that illustration a lot. So justification is by grace alone. Justification is in Christ alone, how is this possible? If, if you think through the argument and the explanations here, okay, which, which there are many people that do, they would come to the conclusion that, that God is unrighteous. How can a just and righteous God declare somebody who's unrighteous righteous? That there's nothing that's just and righteous about that. And so there's questions that come up. How could this be possible? How can God get away with doing that? And I'm thankful that God answers those questions for us. The first way that it's possible is through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. At the end of verse 24, that's what it says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In Christ alone, I am redeemed. I am redeemed. Redemption means to loose, to release by payment. Okay, justification is free. It's a free gift to you and to me, but don't mistake that as being that there's no cost to that. The, our justification came at a very high cost, at a very high price. Peter tells us in 1 Peter, being justified not by works, I mean, not by corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus. 
like as a lamb without spot or blemish. I want you to let that sink in for just a minute this morning. The reason why we can say that we are redeemed and the reason that we can be justified is because of the precious blood of Jesus. He went to a cross. He was beaten. He was spit upon. He had the crown of thorns placed on his shoulder. He was led to the hill of Golgotha. He was laid on the ground. Nails were pierced his hands and his feet, and he hung on a cruel cross, and he shed his blood for the remission of our sins so that we could be redeemed. This is possible because Jesus paid a high cost. And why did it cost so much? Because God's wrath had to be satisfied. Justification in Christ alone. You know what it does? God's wrath was satisfied. Look at verse 25. Look at the beginning. It says, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. That word propitiation, it's another big word that we, that we hear often associated with salvation. Many people are offended by the word propitiation. You know why they're offended by it? The meaning of propitiation, it's the means of appeasing wrath. Okay, so propitiation is the means of appeasing wrath and gaining the goodwill of somebody that you have offended. And it was used especially in regards to false gods. Now, if you want evidence that God is real and that we know about who God is in our hearts, just look at how many worshipers there are in our world. And look at even atheism and people who say that there is no God. They have to spend their life trying to prove that there is no God. But if you look at the world, if you look at idol worship and you look at false gods and you even go through the Old Testament, man, people did all kinds of crazy things to try to appease the wrath of God because inside we know that we're guilty and inside that we know that we're sinners and we know that there's a price that has to be paid. And so sometimes people would go to even horrific Extents, and they would offer up children as sacrifices to appease the wrath of their God. And here, God's using this word propitiation. Jesus was sent forth to be a propitiation. The idea that God gets angry and needs to be appeased is appalling, isn't it? In one sense. I mean, to think of God as being an out of control madman that's filled with rage that we have to run and cower from. If we mess up and we do something wrong, we're just going to get leveled and blasted. We never know what kind of mood he's in. That kind of thinking is preposterous. But yet, God is angry. God hates sin. He is principled. He is predictable. And his controlled wrath rests against evil. And because of his wrath, his wrath had to be satisfied. If he's going to declare anybody righteous, the payment for sin had to be paid. And the payment for sin was death. And you know what he did? He sent forth his son to be the propitiation. And when we sing about the wrath of God being satisfied in Jesus Christ, that is exactly what happened on the cross. You want a simple way to think about it? God himself gave himself to save us from himself. Think about that. God himself gave himself to save us from himself. Who is the chief player in our justification? Did you hear me or I or you mentioned in that at all? It is 100% God. God himself gave himself to save me from, to save us from himself. All right, so not only in Christ alone am I redeemed, not only is God's wrath satisfied, but in Christ alone, he declared his righteousness. This is so important. By forgiving sinners, it appears that God is doing what he said not to do. In the Old Testament, God told the judges, he told the people that, that would stand in judgment of the law when people would come before him, he told them very explicitly that they were to justify the righteous and they were to condemn the wicked. God even said about himself in Exodus, he said, I will not acquit the guilty. So is God, is God being um, unrighteous even in his own character here? He said, I'm not going to acquit the guilty. So people are throwing this back in his face. Again, how can he justify sinners? <laughs> This whole passage is about God righteousing the unrighteous. I like that phrase right there, God righteousing the unrighteous. Look at verses 25 and 26. It says, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, 
to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. God himself wanted to take time to declare his righteousness in acquitting the guilty, in making us righteous and giving us that standing before God. This is important to God. If it's important to God, it's important that we understand it. Y'all ready for a tongue, tongue twister this morning? Go ahead and put that tongue twister up there on the screen, okay? We're gonna say this, let's start slow, all right? This is what verses 24 and 25 are about. Here we go. It is, out loud, the righteous basis on which the righteous God can righteous the unrighteous. All right, let's go a little bit faster. The righteous basis on which the righteous God can righteous the unrighteous. All right, let's go really fast. Are y'all ready? Here we go. The righteous basis on which the righteous God can righteous the unrighteous. I've been practicing this a lot this week, so I got this down. Vivi has not been practicing that a lot this week. But you understand what, what we're saying? That's just, hopefully, maybe you'll remember that, but it's the righteous basis on which the righteous God can righteous the unrighteous. That's what happens in justification. And what is that righteous basis? How can God overlook adultery? How can God overlook murder? How can God overlook those horrific things that David did in the Old Testament? Better yet, how can God overlook my sin? Last week, we talked about the monster that we all have inside of us. I know the sinful man that lives inside of me. How can God overlook my sin? How can he forgive me when I'm guilty and when I'm condemned? He can do it because it was always his fixed intention to punish all of these sins, past, present, and future, in the death of his son, Jesus Christ on the cross. And as a result of that, he is just and he is the justifier. And so if you stand before God and you don't accept Jesus by faith, then he is just in condemning you to an eternity in hell, which is the punishment for our sin, because that's what we've earned and that's what we deserve. But if we stand before God on the basis of the redemption that we have found in Jesus Christ, and he is the justifier, and he says, I am declared righteous, he is declared righteous because his wrath was fully satisfied in the death of his son. And every time the name of Jesus is lifted on high, the world knows that God takes sin seriously. There's a punishment for sin. And this all culminates in this. Justification is by grace alone in Christ alone, through faith alone. Look at verses 27 and 28. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Justification, which is by grace alone, in Christ alone, through faith alone, it eliminates all ground for boasting. What do we as human beings like to do? Because of our sinful nature, we like to boast. We like to justify ourselves. We like to prove when we're in conversations and we're guilty, what's the word that comes up often? But... We like to explain ourselves. We like to justify ourselves. But when it comes to the cross of Jesus Christ, all that we can say is, ha all, all we can do is be silent. We are condemned. We are guilty. There is no ground for boasting. There is no room for it whatsoever. Through faith alone, it excludes boasting. Now, I, I want you to imagine something with me today. Being born into sin, which is what we all are, is like being dropped into the middle of the ocean without a life preserver. Okay, so here's what I want you guys to do. I want you to go with me right now. All of you are in the ocean. You got it? And you're all out there, and you have no boat that you're in. You have no life preserver. You're just out there kicking, doggy paddling, swimming, floating, whatever. And here's what I want you to understand. You can survive for a while like that. You know why? Because we're strong. We're strong in the sense that we're created in the image and likeness of God. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. What is man that thou art mindful of? And man is God's chief creation. We were created in his image and likeness to show his glory. So there's some strength in us. So when you're born into sin, it's essentially the same as being thrown out in the middle of the ocean and you can survive for a while. You can doggy paddle, you can swim, you can even kick back on a nice day and just float and live it up and enjoy your life. But what is going to happen eventually? You're going to drown. 
That's what Paul's saying. We're guilty. We're going down. It's your last chance. I mean, you came up one last time and you gasped for air and you're about to sink. But God intervenes. And he sends his son, Jesus Christ, into the world. And all you have to do is grab a hold of that life jacket right there. And in that moment, it's not about how great anybody is. It's not about what works we have done. No, we are sinking. We are drowning. We are going under. But through faith alone, we grab a hold of Jesus Christ. And we put our faith and trust in him. And instantly, we are saved. So through faith alone, it excludes boasting. But not only that, it also excludes discrimination. Look at verses 29 and 30. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Okay, go back with me into the ocean, right? All of humanity is in the ocean, Everybody's drowning. There's no room for boasting. There's also no room for discrimination because his gift of justification is available to all men. Everybody can be justified. And the only thing that you have to do is grab a hold of the life preserver that's right there that's available for every single person. It's not gonna matter what color you are. It's not gonna matter what country you're from. It's not gonna matter how rich or poor. Everybody's in the same situation. They are desperate and drowning and without hope and all of a sudden God steps in and there's no discrimination. It's available to all. All that matters is that you grab a hold of Christ. All that matters is that we now all have something that is absolutely awesome and amazing and common, and that's Jesus Christ, our Savior. That puts things in perspective. And you know what else through faith alone does? It excludes disobedience. Look at verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. The question comes up, if if it's all free and it costs me nothing and I can be sinful and wicked and do the most horrendous crimes that any human being could ever do and I can still be justified if I grab a hold of faith in Jesus Christ, does the law matter? And Paul says, yes, the law matters. In fact, those who grab a hold of Christ... They prove the righteousness of the law. It starts being lived out inside of them. Here's what we have to understand. There's several times in the, in the New Testament where we're told to put on Christ. The reality is there's, there's a lot of believers that they go over and, and they see the life preserver and they see Jesus and they'll go grab a hold of it. And they're out there still swimming and they're just, they're like this, they've grabbed a hold of it. But you know what Jesus wants us to do? He wants us to put him on. He doesn't want us just to grab a hold of it, man. He wants us to put that thing on. He wants us to zip him up. Thank goodness this fits. I haven't tried this on yet. (laughs) Oh, yeah, it makes me feel like I'm big and strong in here. (laughs) That's what he wants you to do with Christ. Look, he doesn't want you just to kind of have one hand on him. No, grab a hold of Christ, put him on, zip him up. Buckle that thing up. Get safe and sound because we still live in a sin-cursed world with all kinds of turmoil and all kinds of problems. This is what it means to make Christ the treasure of our life. By faith. By faith. We don't just look at Christ as being that nice little thing that came along to help us out so we can continue to live. No, he saved us from destruction. Man, this ought to be the greatest treasure that you have in all of the world because without this, you're lost, you're a goner, you're gonna sink and you're gonna drown. But when you put Jesus Christ on, the more that you love him, the more that you value him, the more that you prize him, the more that you treasure him, all of a sudden you start becoming like him and you start acting different and you start living different and obedience is the best thing in all the world that you can do because you want to please the God in heaven who so freely gave you the most incredible gift that you could ever possibly be given. And I got two practical applications from this whole message. Men, I've got one for you and I've got one for the ladies. Men, be bold as lions. Be bold as lions. Proverbs 28.1, go ahead and put it up on the screen. Proverbs 28.1 says, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Remember, what is justification? Justification is to, what's the two words I told you at the beginning of the message? To declare righteous. 
through faith, by grace, in Christ, through faith, we're declared righteous. Okay, so not only are we not sinking and drowning like anybody else, when we put on Christ, then the righteousness of God starts becoming a part of us. It's, it's who we are. And the Bible tells us that the righteous are bold as lions. The righteous are courageous. You know, one thing I've, I've recognized more and more about men in general, men have this, this strange complexity about them. On one hand, they're passive in a lot of ways. Passive about doing what's right. But we're bold when it comes to sinning and doing what's wrong. That's, that's, a, that's our society today in many ways. I mean, it's amazing to me how bold the lengths that we can go to do things that we know will harm us and damage us, the things that we know that violate God and his word, the lengths that we'll go to do those things because it pleases us and it makes us happy. There's a boldness that comes with that. But you know where that leads? To destruction, The wicked flee when nothing pursues them. It's that guilty conscience that just keeps weighing you down and pounding at you. But the righteous are bold as lions. Think about it. I'm still wearing this life preserver. And you're probably thinking like, what's this crazy guy doing? The world is drowning. I'm safe and secure. I have a different perspective about everything that's going on. I'm not in the middle of that anymore. I'm, I am in a sense, but I'm not, I'm not defeated by that. And so because of that, I can have a righteous boldness in Christ, in my Savior. And I can understand that all of the things that this world has to offer are leading us nowhere. But in Christ alone, I am delivered. In Christ alone, I am saved. There is a better way. God, give us men that will be bold as lions. Give us men that will lift high the name of Jesus. Give us men that will be bold in taking up their cross and following Jesus and in surrendering. Give us men that will be bold in leading their families to Christ and leading their neighbors to Christ and leading their coworkers to Christ. Don't worry about what the rest of the world thinks about us. Don't worry about living like a bunch of people that are lost and headed for destruction. Live for Jesus and be bold. And ladies, laugh at the future. Laugh at the future. Proverbs 31, verse 25. Proverbs 31 is talking about the virtuous woman. And look at what this verse says. It says, strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. You might be wondering, like, how did you get laugh at the future from that? You know what that word rejoice means? That word rejoice literally means laugh play, mock. Laugh, play, walk, mock. One of the many things that, and by the way, strength and honor are her clothing. The righteous are bold as lions. There's a strength that comes. Again, when you put on Jesus Christ, there is a strength and a dignity and an honor that comes with it. And that strength and that boldness that comes from the righteousness of Jesus allows you to look at the future square in the face and say, you're not going to terrorize me. When I think about ladies, when I think about moms, I think of people that care that put their whole heart and soul into their families and into their children and into life, and it's something that never stops. It's still in every grandmother that's here today. It's still in every person and every woman that's fully invested themselves in the lives of somebody else. And you know what? When we think about the sin-cursed world that we live in, we're, we're in the middle of an ocean, right? And we're drowning, and we have an enemy that wants to steal and kill and destroy. And if we let our minds go to the danger that's all around us, guess what? It's gonna lead us in a dark hole real quick and real fast because you start thinking about everything that could come along and stump your kids up. Every sickness, every financial fear, you often feel the full weight of all of that. And you know what a righteous person does? Strength and honor. You put on Christ. Strength and honor. And you're able to look at the future and you're able to say, no, Satan, I'm not letting you take me there because my God is greater. There's a resurrection power that's available to all of us. And I know that my God is able to deliver. And I know that my God is able to get a hold of my children and my grandchildren. And I know that my God is able to intervene. And that's not up to me to be able to do that. My job is just to put on Christ and to live in a way that shows that confidence 
that shows that boldness, that shows that difference, so that God can use that in my home and in my family and in my children's life. God, do you understand what we're talking about this morning? The righteousness, the application of all of this, we're not just declared righteous. That righteousness becomes a very part of who we are, and God leaves us here in this world so that we can take that righteousness and use it in a way that brings honor and glory to him.